On Friday, I had the chance to head up to Mount Baker for my last day of snowboarding of the season. And it was one of those cloudy, stormy days to begin with. The clouds were in, the snow was out, and uh, because of that, there was very bad visibility for the morning. You couldn't see past 20 feet at some points. Um, but later in the day, the clouds cleared a few times, and those of you who have been up there know that the beautiful view of Mount Shuxon that breaks, breaks free. And this is a picture from the top of chair five. And uh, you can see off in the distance there, when the clouds clear, this, this huge, beautiful, magnificent view uh, emerges. I was thinking about those who may have been there for their first time on Friday and the surprise this would have been five hours into the day to realize all this time <laughs> beyond the clouds, they are surrounded by this beautiful, magnificent view. Throughout the day, though, early on, the view was clouded by these adverse conditions of snow and cloud. And it was also blocked because I wasn't always paying attention. I was uh, focusing on trying to stay in control, trying to keep up with Graham and Will and terrain that was a little beyond my skill level. I was so focused on not dying, not falling, that I, I missed the view. And there were a couple of moments where I either came around the corner or more often picked myself from up, a fall, up from a fall to be greeted by this beautiful view that just surprised me. Today we're beginning a new series on the book of Ephesians, and in this early part of Ephesians, Paul is trying to lift our eyes up to a bigger, more magnificent view of who God is. And the reality is that in our life, we sometimes either face adverse conditions or we are so preoccupied with the daily stress and anxiety of life that we miss the bigger story, we miss the bigger picture. And Paul, in this early part of Ephesians, is just trying to cast this beautiful picture, this beautiful vision of who God is. He erupts in this doxology of praise that he almost loses his breath on as he, as he begins this letter. From Ephesians 1, 3 to 14, it is one sentence with 202 words. There's no punctuation. It's just like he's so caught up that he can't stop. He cast this vision of uh, this beautiful picture of God. The reality is there are all these things that block our vision. And we spoke about this on Easter Sunday. We talked about all the stones that need to be rolled back so that we can see the signs of resurrection, the signs of hope in our life. And the good news is that Easter is actually not meant to be just one day. It's a season in the early church. It's supposed to be a 50-day season. Our forebears realized that we needed some time to reckon with the reality of what just happened. The early disciples needed some time to come to grips with what Jesus had accomplished. They were still stuck in fear and regret and doubt. And so during this Easter tide season, I thought, what better book than Ephesians to just help us unpack and, and grasp again the full dimensions of God's love. That's where I want to go for these next few weeks as we journey with Paul into this beautiful picture of all the spiritual blessings that we have in Christ Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but when I first read this text, is this cutting in and out? I'm just going to swap over to the red mic here, so if you want to catch that, Jacob. Testing one, two. There we go. I don't know how you, you felt about the first read of this, but it was just almost overwhelming. I couldn't get my head around it. There's 202 words, each which could be a sermon. So we could be here for 15 hours and not even plumb the depths of this. There's probably 200 sermons in this passage. And so we're not going to get to everything. What I want to just name is a couple of these spiritual blessings that's really uh, captured my attention. And then next week, we'll come back to Ephesians 1, and we'll spend some more time in this. So uh, we're not going to get through all these words. Don't worry. Won't be here forever. But I want us to just pay attention to a couple of these important words that Paul lifts up and praises God with. The first thing I just want to notice before we get into these spiritual blessings is to notice that God is the actor in this text. He is the subject of all the verbs, and that alone is a sermon in and of itself. It's a reminder of the good news that God is the one that initiates salvation. 
It's not something that we earn or something that we do through work, our works, but God is the one who reaches out and initiates this new life for us. There are all these verbs that are ascribed to God. God blesses, he chooses, he destines, he bestows, he lavishes, he makes known, he gathers up. It's just all these verbs, and God is the one that is acting, and that is the beginning of the spiritual journey. That is our hope. We have a picture of a God who's not distant and remote, but that is actively drawing us in to this new life, into this relationship. God blesses us with all these spiritual blessings. And the first one we notice is this beautiful word, chosen. I'm just going to skip ahead here. This word chosen, and and this is what we read in verse 4, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Friends, he chose us. And I think what's really important for us to notice is that he didn't choose us because we were holy and blameless, but so that we could become a holy people. That's a really important important observation. It's not as if God picked us based on our merit or what we've done. He saw us as we were, and he called us into a new kind of life. Holiness is the product of salvation, not the source of salvation. God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. There's something intentional in that. that It wasn't an afterthought. The very foundation of everything. God knew that he would draw people to himself. It's not like we were the last one on the playing field and God said, I guess I'll choose him. It was a God who intentionally sought us out and drew us into relationship. And, And here's the reality. I think we all know in our experience what it's like to not be chosen. We probably have and carry some wounds from not be, being chosen in the past. Some of these wounds go far back, maybe to that playing field in elementary school. Some of those wounds might be more recent, when we weren't chosen for a job or rejected in a relationship. And much of what drives us in our life is trying to compensate for that feeling of not being enough, of being rejected. And so we are trying to prove that we are worthy We're insecure, I think, and it comes from that experience of being overlooked, rejected, not chosen. And so we're curating our Instagram accounts, trying to put out an image that is liked and accepted. Sometimes we're working ourselves to the ground, trying to achieve enough to prove that we are worthy. And through all that, all that striving, all that insecurity, this word breaks through today. And I hope it breaks through to your heart as we hear of this hope of a God who says, I choose you. I choose you. It's interesting in the, the scriptures that uh, those who are chosen by God initially reject it, right? Moses thinks, I'm not good enough. I don't speak well enough. We're not used to that lavish grace, and we feel insecure. When Jesus chooses Peter, it says, go away from me, Jesus, I'm a sinful man. But the hope of this is God sees us in, in our limits and our brokenness, and he calls us into a new reality to become new people, not based on what we've done, but based on his lavish grace This is what uh, Eugene Peterson writes. He says, against this background common to us all of not being noticed, being ignored, being dismissed as of no account, being indistinguishable from the background, the verb chose is a breath of fresh air. God chose us. I just pray that that beautiful blessing, that word might break through some of the things we say of ourselves or some of the things that have been said to us. It's a God who intentionally draws us and chooses us. As the text goes on, we encounter this other beautiful spiritual blessing of being adopted in Christ. And so the next verse we read, In love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. I want to zero in on this word adopted, but before we get there, I think we sometimes get tripped up on this word predestined, and so I want to just speak into that a little bit. We're not going to cover everything. This is a complex idea, but sometimes in our conversations about God electing or destiny, predestining us, we, we come out with this picture of a God who arbitrarily says, well, I want that one, but not that one. 
And we have this kind of image of God that is uh, a difficult image for some of us to wrestle with. And I wanted to speak into that because I don't think that's the image of God that Ephesians 1 is painting. And in our conversations, if our conversations about predestination end with this image of a God who arbitrarily chooses some and rejects others, I don't think we've captured the spirit of this text and the spirit of the broader picture of God in the Gospels. Sometimes I've emerged from debates on predestination, and it seems like people are required then to rewrite John 3.16, the great summation of the Gospel, to say, for God so loved the predestined and the elect that he gave his only Son. And I remind us that there is a more expansive view of God in John 3.16, for God so loved the cosmos, the world, that he gave his only Son. It's a couple of things that we just need to be aware of in this language of election or predestination. And one is that it's, it's a corporate word. So just as Israel was the chosen people that God would use as a light to the nations, now Jesus fulfills that role. And as we are in Christ, we are part of that elect group, that group that is called to be his people. And so that gets us away of this language of God kind of just handpicking individuals, right? It's a broader, just general sense of God destined that there would be a people he would use to bless the world. And so this is from uh, Klein Snodgrass, a great covenant biblical scholar in our tradition. If the focus is corporate rather than individual, and if people are elect only in the elect one Christ, then this text has nothing to do with our fear that God chooses some and ignores others. Um, and then he goes on to say this, which I think is helpful. The focus is God's grace, and this text will not support any discussion about arbitrary decisions from God. And so there's a big conversation there, but I just want to speak, speak into that, that it is in love that God destined, predestined us as adoption. If we get into this image of a, of a God that we fear that we don't trust that is arbitrary. We've missed the spirit. We're outside the bounds of what Paul is talking. I think we just need to allow more mystery around this word and not try and figure it all out. Yeah. We are predestined uh, as adoption, to be adopted as sons. You know, at first, I think maybe we feel a little bit uh, like there is uh, some exclusiveness when we read that word sons, and some translations actually expand it to children, and, and I understand that because Paul clearly includes women in these spiritual blessings. Galatians 3, there is now neither male nor female, you're all one in Christ, we share that. But I think there's something significant in the ancient world why Paul would use that word sons, because in the ancient world, it was only the sons that inherited the land. Right. And so I think what's being communicated is we all, men and women, are adopted as sons, which means we're all adopted into this grand inheritance. And Paul uses that language. We are heirs of the, the very resources of the kingdom of God, men and women together. Right. When uh, Julie and I were down in Guatemala a number of years ago, we were spent some time learning from some missionaries in the area and we had this moment that's always stuck with me, and we were in the center of Guatemala City. There's this community that lives as scavengers, basically, on the garbage dump. And so it's this really bleak and sad scene when a garbage truck would come in. People would uh, gather around it, jockeying for position to try and be, uh, to be able to be the first one to go through the garbage to see if there was something they could sell. It's just intense poverty. We were able to come into some proximity, some community with these folks, learn about their stories. And our mentor and guide in this uh, mission experience was a man named Joel. And he said something that has always stuck with me. And he said, just, the only reason we're not currently swarming that garbage truck, but instead live in a place of relative privilege and affluence in the West, is because of our birth certificate. That's the only reason. <laughs> Had we been born into other circumstances, we might be in a place of deep scarcity. And it kind of goes against that merit-based feeling that we have, that we've kind of earned what, we've, what we have. But so much comes down to family of origin, to the nature of our birth certificate. And I just, as I think about this image, I pick, pick up on this, this idea of what it would be like for an orphan living in the dumps in Guatemala to suddenly find themselves adopted into a family of great privilege, how transformative that would be for them. 
right? There's access to nutrition and education and an inheritance awaiting them. A, a radical transformation of their current life now and in the future. And to me, this picture of adoption, it expands the scope of the gospel. Sometimes in our communication about the good news of the gospel, we focus a lot on justification, that God has paid for our sins and therefore we are no longer guilty. It's this legal metaphor. And that is a biblical metaphor. It's a beautiful metaphor. But it's not the only metaphor of atonement. And I think Paul, even in this text, has two or three different metaphors or images or pictures of atonement and, and salvation, that we, we just need to expand that. And this is uh, what J.I. Packer says. I found really helpful as he meditates on this picture adoption. He says this, justification is a forensic idea conceived in terms of law and viewing God as judge. Adoption is a family idea conceived in terms of love and viewing God as father. In adoption, God takes us into his family and fellowship and establishes us as his children and heirs. And then he goes on to say, closeness, affection, and generosity are at the heart of the relationship. To be right with God, the judge, is a great thing. But to be loved and cared for by God, the Father, is a greater one. Now, again, hear the both and, right? We're, we're still embracing the language of justification, but this adoption metaphor, I think, just expands the scope of the gospel. It's not just that we are guilt-free. We are in relationship. We have closeness, affection, the generosity of a God who draws us in. It starts to get at this, this refrain, in Christ, which shows up throughout the book of Ephesians. We are not just forgiven. We are in union. We are in relationship with Christ. And that radically changed our life now, not just when we die, <laughs> but now because we are in relationship with our Heavenly Father in Christ. So we have this beautiful blessing, spiritual blessing of adoption. The third one that I want to just name, you can see why we have to limit to three. I'm already saturated. I'm probably just like benediction. Let's just go sit with that for two weeks. But Paul keeps going. <laughs> and he says in verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood. This is another word I just want to name and focus on a little bit. And it's also a word, again, that expands us beyond just justification. Redemption is about being released from slavery. It is language that's used in the Old Testament to depict the Exodus story, which we just spent a couple of months on. God is redeeming the people from slavery. In the Greek world, redemption comes up in the context of people who are able to buy their way out of slavery. It's about release, freedom from bondage. I came across actually a good contemporary use of this word that I think kind of fits. There's a commentator I was reading. He talked about a time he was preaching in a big city, and there was an event that day, and he didn't realize the parking cha uh, rules changed. And when he got out of preaching, his car was gone been towed. There's nothing sacred in this town, he said, yeah. <laughs> towing the preacher's car. And he had to figure out where it was, and he went to the DMV or wherever. And when he went to get his car, he was led into the redemption center to redeem his car. And he paid the fees to free it up. And so we still kind of use this, this word as, as freeing, redeeming, right? This is what I think significant about this word redemption. And it reminds us again about the full scope of what Jesus did on the cross. There's forgiveness in view. That's actually the next, next part of this. But it's not just that Jesus deals with those feelings of guilt that we have or the, the reality of guilt. God also wants to release us from what's enslaved us. And he pays this ransom so that we can be freed and I wonder if that might just be some good news to some of us today because we're not only just feeling the, the, the experience of guilt, but we're feeling trapped and we're feeling enslaved. And to just meditate on this hope of a God who wants to lead us on an exodus. Jesus uses exodus language when he goes to Jerusalem and talks in Luke 9 about the exodus that he will undergo. God wants to lead us not just out of guilt, but out of bondage. It's a beautiful picture of this full scope of a God who wants to liberate us. Does that meet some of us as good news in those places where we feel trapped, where we feel overwhelmed, where we feel entangled by the sins 
in our lives. There's a God who wants to free us today. There's so much in this text that I think just removes some of the clouds, uh, the limited theology that clouds our vision of this more magnificent, bigger view of God. And my prayer through this series is that we would discover a bigger picture that, that is veiled so often. Last Sunday, our men's group uh, was meditating on a section in Mark 6, and it's the story where Jesus goes to his hometown, and it's this part where he says, a prophet has no honor in his own house, and he's not able to, to work in their lives because they limit Jesus. He's just the carpenter. What's he saying? That's Mary's son. That's James's brother. And it says, because... Uh, he was in his hometown. He couldn't do that deeper work in their life. They limited him. They put him in a box. They were too over-familiar with Jesus to allow this bigger vision to break into their world. And as we sat with that text in silence last Sunday, I just had this sense of God saying to me, Phil, don't limit me. Don't limit me. Don't put me in a box. Don't limit my power and my grace. And sometimes... In the house of the Lord, we limit God. We're maybe too over-familiar with God. We think we have God figured out. And I just want to join Paul in his prayer later in Ephesians that God would just help us grasp the full dimensions of his love, the height, the depth, the length, the, the width, the love of God. I pray that God might just remove the veil, that we might not limit him and discover this magnificent picture of a God who wants to do so much more than we can ask or imagine spiritually. Well, I want to end just with this call to the practice of worship today. And I just remind us that in this text, Paul is not doing systematic theology. He is practicing doxology. <laughs> this is not the study of God theology. This is the praise of God doxology. And, and I I think this is actually the window by which we begin to see God more clearly. And Voskamp has this quote where she says that doxology, the praise of God, drives away the darkness. The psalmist says we enter his gates with thanksgiving in our heart. One of the ways that we open the gates into the presence of God is with thanksgiving and praise. And so I pray today and this week that we might just get caught up with Paul in the practice of praise, that we might come with our own doxology of praise and so discover a God that is so much bigger than we realize Today, may we join Paul with this word of praise. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. May you join me in prayer. God, I pray that you would open our eyes to a bigger picture. We, we praise you and we thank you that you are a God who acts. You're a God who chooses us. You're a God who's drawn us into your family. You're a God who desires to redeem us, to liberate us from those things that enslave us. Lord, forgive us for the ways we, we limit you. And would you open our eyes this Easter season, roll back those stones that get in the way of seeing the hope of resurrection. Would you do this work in and among us, even here and now, as we continue in worship. Amen.